I'm sorry, yeah, George. Good morning to you. You're a half hour late, George. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't started yet, George. <laughs> Is this going to be how we're going to do it in the future, where we have conversation between you, uh, Bryn, and the commission prior to the meeting starting? I think it's fine if there are um, points of clarification needed and, and okay. Commissioner Lazell's request for the to have available that federal legal framework, which we intended to do anyway, is a, a point very well taken will be useful to the commission during the discussion. Um, okay, I understand. So this is just, there is always the possibility that we can have conversation with you prior to the meeting starting. Sure. Yes, if it's regarding meeting materials or any points of order about the meeting that you're anticipating, we're, we're happy to review those ahead of time. What if I don't and, want to join? What's that? What if I don't want to join? <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> it is nine o'clock and we are recording. Okay, why don't we go ahead and start. Good morning. My name is Don Michaelman, and I want to welcome you to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, before we start, uh, I'd like to have the commission members introduce themselves as I call their name. Ted? Ted Gamboji. Stan? Good morning, Stan Goligoski. Tom? Hi, Gazimus. Tom Hutchison. Greg? Uh, Greg Lazell. George. Good morning, George Lee. Butch. Uh, Butch Tracy. Good morning. Good morning, all. I hereby call to order the Thursday, February 25th, 2021, public hearing of the City of Prescott Planning Commission. This is an open public hearing and is being tape recorded and videotaped by the city. The proceedings are being televised by representatives of the public media. The public, local cable, and or radio stations may also be rebroadcast. The number of commission members present is seven. Uh, as this meeting is being remotely telecast or offered, all parties wishing to be heard, including commission members, are asked to state their name prior to speaking in order to ensure accurate minutes. Members of the public, when called upon, are required to state their name and address for the record so that we may know who is speaking and be able to contact them at a later date if necessary. This meeting is a study session only. There will be no voting. There will be another continuation of this meeting, of this subject at our next meeting. Public comment will be accepted and look forward to after the presentation by the city and the commission members have had a chance to have questions on that. The first item on the agenda is the minutes of the January 28, 2021 minutes. Are there any corrections to the minutes? If no correction, is there a motion concerning the minutes? This is uh, Commissioner Lozell. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes from our last meeting. We have a motion to approve. Is there a second? I was Go ahead. Right. We have a motion and second. Any further discussion? If not, we will vote on it. Uh, Kaylee, if you could call the roll for the vote, would appreciate it. Yes, and just to be clear, that second was from George Lee. Um, okay, so Butch Tracy? Yes. George Lee? Yes. Greg Lazell? Yes. Thomas Hutchison? Uh, yeah, approve. Stan Goligoski? Yes. Ted Gamboji? Approve. Don Michaelman? Approve. Motion passes 7 0. Okay. Next on the agenda is LDC. 21-001. This is the amendment to the Land Development Code, Article 2, Section 2.4.49, Telecommunications Facilities to create development criteria 
to permit these facilities with an allowance for the height to exceed the zoning district height in commercial and industrial zoning districts require concealment and screen equipment compounds. Tammy, are you up? Yes, I am, sir. Okay, so for some background to kind of recap why we're here. So um, we were asked to bring forward an amendment to our land development code. Um, the, the goal of it was possibly for an allowance for height to exceed the zoning district's height. Um, but the other three things that the city council wanted us to look at was to require concealment of facilities, as in stealth, stealth towers, screen uh, equipment compounds, and to encourage co-location. Uh, most of these things we do now, we do um, encourage, and most most companies when they do come forward do do stealth towers now because they don't want them to stand out. They most of them are concealed. Um, they do screen their compounds with uh, six foot masonry walls. That's pretty common that we consistently see, and most of them are do want to co-locate because. And that's why they ask for the additional height usually is because you need the height for to allow for another facility to go on it. And if we have co-location, you have less towers. That was kind of the goal. So our current process for processing um, wireless facilities is if, if they're going to exceed the zoning <coughs> height allowance, they do have to go through this, the special use permit process, which comes through the Planning and Zoning Commission for recommendation and then ultimate appro uh, approval or denial by the City Council. So that's our current process, as long as it's exceeding the zoning height allowance. <coughs> So in the background, there have been no changes to the LDC, the Land Development Code, since 2003 when it became implemented. Uh, my understanding is it was originally adopted in 2001, and then they did, it didn't become effective till 2003. So this was discussed at a study session with the City Council on October 27, 2020, in which we were given direction on the three goals that they wanted us to, to try to address. And this was also discussed at the January 28th Planning and Zoning Commission meeting in which you gave us direction. We gave you two, ver two different versions, um, an update of the current code and a total rewrite um, of the code. And what we got out of that was that in residential zoning districts, um, including multifamily and such, that you wanted to keep it as the existing height allowance and that we, wanted to go through the SUP process, continue that process. So um, we, what we're bringing back to you today is an update of the current ordinance. Um, our goal is to take out some of the outdated language and requirements. Um, this was done back in 2001. There are a lot of things that um, it's very difficult for companies to provide, such as um, locations of other towers that could become a an issue with um, <coughs> security issues. Um, they don't no longer have to provide us with a mailing list of the property owners within 300 feet. We do that ourselves. In 2001, we didn't have the capability of doing that through our GIS, but we've come, um, we've, but we do have um, the ability to do that now. Um, Another thing is that they, before they had to show the zoning, the zonings adjacent or close to the property. We do that now. We have our own mapping layers that we provide to you and to show you the surrounding zoning where the imagery that shows you where houses are and such. Um, we also added new definitions from FCC regulations such as um, the substantial, um, See what was it? It was the um, the height along with the changes, the modifications, the substantial increase. That's actually out of um, FCC 6409, which it was defined. FCC went through and defined actually what a substantial increase is, and that language you see being proposed is directly from that. So we can't really change that. Um, updates criteria to allow towers to exceed height allowance of zoning district. Um, we just Right now, we just propose that in commercial and industrial. We'll go through that. And then add criteria for concealed telecommunication facilities in all residential and commercial. 
and industrial was one that we were going to uh, look at. Um, the proposed height allowance. So for residential and light commercial. So in the real estate and the multifamily mixed use in all those these zoning districts, we propose a concealed telecommunications facilities that meet the height limitations for the underlying zoning district shall be permitted. That's pretty much what it reads now. So in, a, in a way, we wanted to clarify that. Um, we did add a light commercial. And so in the next part, under the rural estate, single family, the residential transition, multifamily, mixed use district, neighborhood oriented business districts, those all allow for a 35 height is what's allowed in that, those zoning districts. In a residential office, they're allowed a 25 foot height allowance. There's not a whole lot of the residential office in the city, so we didn't see that as a concern. Um, and then the downtown business district, um, single family is allowed 35 feet in height and 50 feet for other uses. So we wanted to maintain those height allowances because most probably in the downtown business, we're probably gonna see more of the small cell sites going in the right of ways, which is regulated by state statutes and goes through a different process. So that's kind of what we're proposing for um, the residential and the light commercial. Um, it was concealed and it has to meet the underlying zoning district height which is pretty much what our code says now, but we want, wanted to make sure that it's more defined. Mr. Chair, this is Bren. Uh, may I ask uh, Tammy a question, a clarifying question? Sure. Uh, with Tammy, with regard to sure. the 35 foot height allowed, I just want to clarify, are we referring to solely wireless communications facilities or is 35 feet the maximum height for building signage and other uh, items you might find in the landscape? Um, basically, with a 35 foot height, that would be for any structure. So if it's going to be stealth like onto an existing building, that building has to meet the height allowance, and then they can be added onto that facility. And if it's a new tower, um, then it has to meet that height to the from the natural grade existing grade to the highest point. So if it's stealth, we're looking at the very top of the, the leaves. Thank you. The stealthing of it. So, however way it's concealed via water tank, via um, a flagpole or anything, we need to look at the maximum height of that structure. Okay. Um, for, for commercial in the business general and the business regional, um, this is something that we can discuss. We're looking at allowing for a 70 foot height because we want to try to maybe encourage, give them some, um, some, uh, other alternatives to the residential is the commercial, the business general and business regional. They both allow for the 50 foot height um, allowance. So we were looking at maybe allowing for a 70 foot height in, the, in those, zone, those two zoning districts. And then with right now, the business general does allow for 50 feet. The business regional, it's 50 feet and then up to 100 feet with SUP. So, but this, this criteria would allow for 70 feet in these two zoning districts if this is something the commission feels is appropriate. And, and then also in those two zoning districts, it also have to be concealed, be stealth. For industrial, um, they do allow for the different industrial, so industrial transition allows for a 40 foot height. Industrial light allows for a 50 foot height currently. An industrial general allows for 50 feet and then up to 100 feet with the SUP. Um, what was being suggested was an 80 foot height in the industrial zoning district. Now we didn't have stealth in this, um, but with something that we can add if the commission wants to is to require stealth in the industrial zoning districts. And the, the 80 feet is not something we're Bound to, we can that can be something to be discussed too to adjust. And so, out of the last meeting, what we got was that the the commission wanted us to continue the SUP process as we have now. So, this is the language that in all districts, the city shall have the authority to vary the height restrictions listed in this section through a special use permit upon the request of the applicant 
and a satisfactory showing of the need for greater height. So with that, they usually, that's when they show us the RF propagation maps, they show us the elevations, they show us the renderings, they show all that information with that application to show the need for the greater height. With its special use permit request, the applicant shall submit such technical information or other justifications as are necessary to document the need for the additional height to the satisfaction of the city council. Things that we cannot look at, we cannot require NEPA, we don't require NEPA for anything, but we do can ask for the RF, RF propagation maps, which is where you see the different colors for um, the existing service. And then if the tower goes in at that, what they're proposing, how it's gonna infill that need. So Tammy, Tom here. Sure. Um, in, my, in my mind's eye, I can't see where this, I, I can't see a place where this would apply, but if you if you lived in a in a in a place a hollow somewhere somewhere very low perhaps that there basically there was no cell coverage um, it, does does this allow us to basically go outside of the box and do or, or allow anything that 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 could make that dead zone become active Yes, if, it, if they're going to exceed the height allowance and go through this process, yes, that's where we look at it. Look at that process. Um, it's either usually what we're seeing right now is either for it to fulfill a dead zone, as you said, to like a whole area, or it's a data capacity issue. Like we showed at the last meeting, the technology that of our devices um, use so much more data that they, that's something we are seeing. And that's what a lot of the small cell sites are coming forward is to um, create um, in, put an infill of that data capacity issue they're having. Um, that mostly in certain areas, we have a lot of traffic that comes through. We have a lot of tourists that come through. We have a lot of activities coming through and uh, we use our cell phones for everything. There are GPS units, there are mapping. That's how we look at everything is through either our phones or our tablets. And so that's what we're kind of seeing coming forward is the need for the, the data capacity issue. So this process, the SGP, which is what you do now um, for anything, you allow, you're allowed to look at all those things to see if that's, that if this is, if they've proven that this is what is required to fulfill that need. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I did. Thank you. Yeah. So we did propose three questions um, in your packet to kind of get this kind of discussion to kind of give us a better direction of how you see this going forward. And so the first question was, should the city consider creating an allowance for telecommunications facilities to exceed the zoning district height in any zoning district or should all height exceptions require an SVP? So for this, you know, right now we're proposing uh, for the, the commercial, more commercial and for industrial to allow for an additional height allowance. And um, that's something we wanna know if that's something you still see that be a good thing or if they should have to meet the height restrictions and require the SUP process. So Chairman, I don't know if you want to go through and see um, what each commissioner's take is on this or. I, that, I agree, Tammy. I think that'd be a good idea. If the commissioners would like to make a comment at this time or not, I will go through the role here and give everybody an opportunity on this. Uh, Butch, would you like to start off? Yeah, you know, I, I'm not really ready to comment on, on this time. I need a little more info. Okay, George. Uh, I have a question and you, you know that I've been, I haven't been to two meetings. My question is, it's kind of confusing for me. Should the city consider creating an allowance for telecommunications facility to exceed the zoning district height in any zoning district slash or my question is right there. I don't understand what that statement is. So we'll go back to this. So in right now, what's being proposed in, in this uh, update 
is that in the business general and business regional, we are, we are considering adding, allowing for a 70 foot height. So right now in the business general and business regional, they can go 50 feet in height um, by right. So we're proposing a 70 foot height allowance to try to encourage them to go to those zoning districts. Most of the commercial and industrial that we have in the city are in very low areas. And that's why we are gonna, most of the time we see these coming up in the residential because those are in the high areas where the towers wanna go. They wanna go up high so they can communicate with the other towers. But we wanna to try to give incentivize them to possibly go through our commercial and industrial. And this is an option to try to incentivize that. So in the commercial business general and business regional, we're looking at 70 feet. And if that's something the commission doesn't feel comfortable with, then we can just keep it at the 50 feet, the existing zoning district allowance and anything above that would have to come through the SUP process, which is the process we have now. Right. So in the industrial, we are looking at an 80 foot, but if the commission doesn't feel comfortable with that, I mean, we can just make it where all the zoning districts have to meet the height allowance and anything above that goes to the SUP. So basically nothing will be changing from our existing process. Mm -hmm. Or do we want to incentivize in some, some zoning districts to allow for a greater height to try and encourage them to go in those zoning districts? So that's kind of the question in front of you right now. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Greg. You yeah, this is um, kind of on track what we were talking about last time. And uh, I think we're we're there. Uh, you uh, you kind of kept it the same process in the residential, if I'm reading that correctly, and giving some more leeway in the other districts. And uh, I think we're on the right track. Okay. Tom? Um, I'm, as I stated earlier, I'm strongly in favor of hearing the voice of our customer, which is the, which is the, the citizens of the city. So, so I'm, I'm in support of a, the SUV, SUP process um, for everything. Everything should go through an SUP. And that, that allows us to hear what the, the neighbors and the people are thinking. Okay, Stan. Yeah, I really like it. I like what uh, we kind of compromised based off of the last meeting. Uh, the residential, we focus on the residential, we, we maintain the same height. Uh, I think that was a great, great, again, compromise. I like the height uh, increases, and the first this is the first time that I'm hearing the word encouragement for the business in commercial or industrial areas, and I think that is very smart. So, but the fact that we're keeping it in the SUP process, that's uh, very sound. That's what I voted for last time, and I'd like to remain. Um, there's another portion, and I don't know, it's one of the three, in one of the three questions, but it's on the portion of the camouflage, um, you know, making it mandatory. I don't think we should make that a mandatory because there's different environmental pieces. Um, you know, when I think uh, someone brought up the, the bluff out Williamson Valley mm -hmm. and the big tree sticking out there, that may be, <laughs> some things don't fit very well. So, so if that I feel like it's kind of part of uh, question one as well, but um, but that's where I stand. Okay, thank you. Ted. I think we have a whole lot more work to do and, and uh, especially from the perspective of educating the public. Um, this, this last meeting over the cell phone tower got kind of reminded me of, I want to go to Paris, but I don't want to burn fossil fuels. Um, I, I'm in favor. I, I think uh, Tammy's idea of, of motivating cell towers to move into industrial areas is a good one, so I support that. Uh, but I think also we need to spend some time educating ourselves and getting a a, a clear position and educating the public because um, with, with the uh, advent of technology, 
we're going to be facing this over and over again. So we're going to have to make a decision how we're going to, how are we going to accommodate technology on these new phones and 5G networks that comes up with a community agreeable solution? Okay. I also am leaning toward this. I like the concept of giving an incentive to the cell phone companies to place their towers outside of residential areas. It still allows it when all other options are not there, but it has to be reviewed if it's going to be over the uh, zoning requirements. But having them go to commercial or industrial areas and giving them more uh, leeway on the height, I'm in favor of. I would like to, hopefully we can get more comment from the public on this too. So I'm not sure I want to make a vote right now, but I'm leaning toward this. Tammy, back to you. Yes. Okay, thank you. That was great. That's kind of what we're looking for. Um, and we understand that, that there's still questions. So we hopefully be able to answer a lot of it through this process. So the second question we had was, should the process to exceed the allowed height allowance in commercial industrial be through a special use permit process. So we were looking at whether it should be um, through the SUP process or through the variance process. Um, but from what we've understanding that you like the, the SUP process. So we'll continue with that process rather than trying going through the variance process for board of adjustments. So we will keep with the SUP process moving forward. Um, the last question we had was about the concealed. So whether they should all be concealed or just right now what we way it is awarded is for everything except industrial. And there is one industrial one that you may see on um, 89, um, the industrial area before you get to um, Watson, I mean, Will, Watson Lake. Um, there's a cell tower there that's painted brown and it blends into the hillside. So that is a self tower. It's painted to match the background color. So, but so the way we have it defined in this uh, version for concealed telecommunication facilities, antennas must be enclosed, camouflaged, screened, obscured, or otherwise not readily apparent to the casual observer. So, it doesn't have to be a tree. It doesn't have to be a water tank. It can be painted to match the background color, so it blends in. So that's, this is allowing for that, which was also someone else's, you know, does a tree make sense? Like the one out, I know it's the one out Williamson Valley. Uh, it's about an 80 foot pine tree on top of the hill. Um, I processed that use permit process application, lots of opposition and support from the area, but it does stick up on top of a vacant hill. You know, does that make sense? Probably not. If it was painted some color like a blue or off white or something, it may have blended in a little bit better to the background and not as visible to the eye as you're driving down Williamson Valley and just see this pig tree or whatever it looks like out there. So, and then existing structures utilized to support the antennas must be allowed within the underlying zoning district. So basically, if it's going in a commercial zoning district or even in a residential and it's being attached to an ex a structure, that structure has to be allowed within it. We're, we aren't going to allow a structure or a use that's not allowed in that zoning district. So this kind of just clarifies that um, moving forward. Mr. Chair, if I could ask a question. That's great. Uh, Tammy, let's go back and pick on the county for a minute so it kind of be direct from us. Uh, <laughs> let's go to that tree. <clears throat> and that process, and this is kind of one of those educational things that Ted was talking about. When that went through, the county can't dictate what it looked like. Is that correct? Correct. That, that was brought forward by the applicant um, to try to have something that didn't just stick out. But if it was just a monopole, it may have blended a little bit better than that tree did. But I'm, I'm trying to go, it, would that be part of the, and I, I don't know if uh, if our legal is on here, but would that be part of the, re, the limitation of a municipality or, or a government agency to dictate what it looks like? Is it up to the cell people to give us ideas or how does that process work? 
Um, but, well, sometimes, well, before they come through the SUP process, they do talk to staff and we do discuss different options. So if they have something that, that, that maybe might not fit into the area, we might be able to talk to them and get, hey, if you propose this, it may go over better. Because um, we do have those discussions ahead of time. This allows it, and which they could do now, basically, if they came forward um, with a tower and it's painted, like if it's next to a building and they want to paint it the color, same similar color to the building, so it may blend in, you don't visually see it as much, we would support that. And this would allow for that. Okay. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I, I, I keep getting messages like, we can't find you. <laughs> I'm here, I promise. Um, Mr. Pedraki so is here. Under the Federal Telecommunications Act, Greg, there's a, a preservation of local zoning authority. And the actual law states that except as provided in this paragraph, nothing in this chapter shall limit the effect of the authority of a state or local government, which is Prescott, or instrumentality thereof over decisions regarding the placement, construction, and modification of personal wireless, wireless service facilities. And then there are those five limitations we talked about afterwards. But um, as, as a general rule, what the, the Telecommunications Act of 1996 wanted to do was leave some uh, local zoning authority in place uh, and probably one of those uh, decisions that it leaves in place for you or to kind of determine, uh, you know, the, the scope and the design a little bit of uh, a cell tower, so long as it doesn't kind of conflict with those limitations. Um, so, you know, what we can't do is create some sort of design standards that would somehow discriminate a, a, amongst providers. Um, but I think generally there, there's the idea was to maintain some level of, of local zoning authority. So the answer is, I think to your question is, yeah, you, you have some discretion there. Thanks, Mr. Matt. Chair. Yes, Brad. Thank you. I just wanted to make a clarifying comment um, and sort of recall everybody back to the outcome of our study session at the council, wherein they actually specifically requested that we mandate concealed facilities. And again, that definition can be uh, extrapolated in a number of ways, whether it's to paint the tower itself, to disappear into the background, or to specifically conceal it to make it look like something vegetative or otherwise. I just wanted to remind the commission of that directive from the council. Thank you. Okay. And then what's being proposed before you would require it concealed in all zoning districts, except the industrial, but we can add it to the industrial if the commission wants to. We, like I said, we were just trying to give some, some leeway and some uh, encouragement to go to industrial. But most of the cell towers that we do see, most of them do come in with concealed because they do want to blend in and look nice. But then sometimes they don't. We see them in Prescott Valley next to water tanks and or even in town, we've seen it on industrial property. Um, there's one on Iron Springs Road that's not concealed behind a business and it's industrial and it wasn't required to be concealed. So, but it and is I'll, something we can. I'll defer to Tammy and Brent on this, but you know, my sense is most jurisdictions do require some level of concealment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very common. Yeah. So it's kind of a, an industry practice almost at this point. Mm -hmm. But like I said, for the um, industrial, we can and conceal. There's not a problem uh, with the final one coming through to you. So, but we are requiring it in all residential, all zoning districts, except the industrial at this time. Any so other? the question is, do we want to add it? Do you like it way, the way it is? Or do we want to make sure add it to conceal to the industrial too? Tammy, would you want each commission members to make a comment at this time? Sure, that'd be good. All righty. Why don't we start off? Butch, would you want to make a comment? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Let me make sure I was not muted. Uh, yeah, actually, that explained a lot to me. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, after reading this, I mean, it, the, the language that's in it, uh, part A, antennas must be enclosed, camouflage screen, obscured or otherwise. I think that sets a directive for, for what they're doing. And like you say, if it has to come to a special use permit, 
everybody has a chance to weigh in on that. And, uh, and apparently they're also going to come with the type of camouflage or the type of, of thing that they're doing, which, you know, that makes it just very clear to me. I mean, it's going to be, everybody will have a chance to weigh in and, and uh, I'm, I'm all for that. Would you want to see the concealed required in industrial too, or leave it open up to the applicants? Yeah, I guess um, that would be a, you know, the thing with industrial, it's still being viewed by, by well, your residential also. So uh, everything around it. So I'm, I'm saying that, I, I don't know, I like the, the idea. It's still a special, okay. well, I guess if it's, it meets the height, it's not under a special use permit, but I think maybe a little language that way might, might not hurt. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Butch. George? Um, I agree with Butch. I like the idea of it being um, camouflaged, and, uh, and so I think we should add it to the industrial as well. Okay. Okay. Greg? Yeah, I, I'm, for the fact to just make it across the board that, it, you know, it's not an exception and didn't go to, like, um, uh, what you're saying, let's just, and it is being viewed. So, yeah, I'm for just, in all the districts, it's, it needs to be uh, camouflaged or concealed or however this is termed. <clears throat> Okay, Tom. Um, I like the idea of uh, of concealment, but I don't believe it's necessary for all in all cases. Uh, I, th I think about the cell tower they put it put up uh, going out uh, Iron Spring Road to uh, uh, towards Skull Valley. Uh, th there would be no need to to camouflage that. There's nothing out there, so yeah. maybe that's county property. I, whatever. I just, it just seems like it's overly restrictive to me to di dictate ca uh, concealment everywhere. And that tower, just so you know, because of the height, um, it would have been very difficult from an engineering standpoint to camouflage it. Um, they did the monopole just so, cause it blended in a little, the idea was that um, it would blend in better to the view shed. So on that one, cause I, I did that use permit too. <laughs> Okay, Stan. Yeah, I'm. Uh, thanks for the explanation, Tammy. Uh, for one, I like the. I actually do like the mandate for ca uh, camouflage, knowing that it could just be painted. <clears throat> I'm in favor of adding it to industrial as well, uh, knowing that it could be a certain paint, even if it's a rust color and that blends in. Then you know that's that's what and they decide. I think the explanation really goes well, so I'm in favor for all zones. Okay, Ted? I'm in favor of uh, camouflage, uh, but I think it's important th that we communicate that we can do a good job, we can't do a perfect job. And we can't let perfect be the enemy of good. Okay. Myself, I think about when I go downtown and down near the Hacienda Hotel, there is a tower down there that is just a plain, plain tower, and it can be seen very readily. Yet within two blocks, there's another cell phone tower that's painted to look like the building it's adjacent to, and you don't see it real quick. I believe that all towers in all districts need to have something or that either be painted or to match the area to blend in or be camouflaged there. And can we make, or is it already there that whenever a cell phone goes up, it has to be a re reviewed by the city to see what, how they plan to decorate it, even if it's under the, within the height limit of allowable in that zoning? We do, we do review all of them because it's through the building permit process. Okay. Do we need to have the wording such that they will be either camouflaged or <clears throat> painted to blend in? And that is at the cities? No, that this, this, will, this will require that. So when the, if, it, if it's allowed, like it comes in and it's allowed under the height response, when they come in for their building permit, we review them all. This does not pertain to the ones in the right of way though. Right away, the ones in the right away, like the other one you mentioned, those are um, through 
other requirements and uh, statutory allowances. So what we're looking at is just for private property and not in the city right of ways. I've noticed that the ones I've seen in the city right away, they have all been painted. They're not just stark, you know, metal on that yes. part too. But I also agree that should be in every zone. Okay, awesome. Perfect, that's what we're looking for. This is George. Yes. I have a question. Are we talking about existing or just new applications coming in for new towers? New ones. We can't retroact this on ones that are already approved. That's what I was wondering. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Chair. Yes, friend. Thank you. I just wanted to make a, another comment that um, as this is an ordinance amendment, it would, if, if approved by the council, it would go into effect 30 days following approval. Okay. Are there any more questions or comments by commission members? This is Commissioner Gambogi. I think uh, Tammy's done a lot of work and uh, I want to thank her for that. Thank you. I think we all agree to that. So any other comments or questions? So for conclusion, this was a discussion item today. Um, we're not going to vote today, but we've gotten some great direction on where to come for the next tier, next uh, meeting, uh, March 11th. This will be a hearing item. Um, it's being advertised. So where we can have more discussion and then you'll be able to vote at that time. So what we're asking now, we do have some members of the public um, that would like to speak if you're ready for that. I believe we are. Okay. So first we have um, Ann Friday. Ann, if you unmute yourself, there you go. Good morning, commissioners. Ann Friday, 3398 Bar Circle A Road, Prescott. After reviewing the most recently proposed update to the Land Development Code 2.4.49 Wireless Telecommunication Facilities, I really have to ask, how do we get to the point of obliterating almost all of our residential neighborhood protections that we already have in the existing code? And looking at the January 28, 2021 minutes of the planning and zoning discussion, here are the three principles requested by city council members. One, mandatory concealment, stealth design in residential area. Two, a stated preference for co-location and usage of already compromised sites. Three, requirement screen ground infrastructure. I think most residents have no objection to two and a half of these three principles, but added into principle two is some new language usage of already compromised sites. What is the definition of an RA compromised site? While that's not provided in the proposal, it has been discussed in previous council meetings and described as a site having a water tank on it. If the water tank is no taller than the allowed underlying zoning district height limits, as example, a site which has a 30 foot tall half of a water tank in a multifamily medium zoning height limit of 35 feet, how is that site compromised? In a, by example, this water tank blends in with the natural background, is shorter than the 35 foot height limit, and is no more compromising than if a home had been built there and is in fact the same 30 feet high as allowed by that HOA CCNR height limits. So that site is not already compromised, but adding a 55 foot cell tower that can then go up to 80 feet will compromise it. Instead of an already compromised site, it will become a compromised site. I think the current LDC wireless facility code is well written. And if any part is updated, it should be to strengthen it rather than to erase the neighborhood protections already written into it. Council member Kathy Rusing stated this in a council meeting last year. So adding in the two and a half stated principles written above and defining already compromised site in a way we can all agree on, that would make a minor improvement to the existing code. However, the current proposal eliminates public notice, adverse aesthetics, safety, 
alternative site studies, proof of a significant service gap in the tower site area, selecting the least intrusive site, Property devaluation with the resulting loss of city property tax revenue is an invitation to sell carriers to come into our residential areas and be bad neighbors. We don't want that in our neighborhood, nor would you. Chairman, we're at three minutes. Now, Do you want to allow her to keep going? Sure, let her go ahead. Yes. Okay. Let her go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'll talk faster. I was stated just today that no NEPA is required. However, FCC does require NEPA, and we do have endangered bald eagles that we cherish in this city. Also, capacity was mentioned as a justification for a new cell tower, but capacity is not an FCC justification, only a significant service gap and the least intrusive site. These maps that were mentioned, the RF property maps and the infill maps, those are not certified RF studies. Those are available online and the public has access to those. Also, there is a requirement to look for alternative sites. And then in the last meeting, there was a statement made that uh, multifamily medium areas are more disturbed areas when there was a discussion of going up to 60 feet but in my own neighborhoods, single family and multifamily medium are the same. My one level single family home is on a ranch at Prescott, Mystic Heights lot zoned MFM. There are no more disturbed areas in the MFM ranch lots than the single family nine Yavapai Hills lots. And even a trained zoning eye cannot walk the streets and point out the single family from the multifamily medium. Secondly, courts have ruled that adverse aesthetic impact, safety issues, and property value declines are all valid reasons to deny a cell tower permit. Restrictions on cell tower siting is not equivalent to prohibiting cell tower service. Restrictions ensure responsible cell tower siting and good neighbors. And as attorney Padraki stated today, there is local control. So in conclusion, the proposed rewrite of the wireless facilities on property, private property is an open door to the cell carrier companies, removing all of our neighborhood protections. And it really shows a gross insensitivity to the residents of Prescott who will be destined by this careless rewrite to devaluations in their peace of mind, economic worth, health and safety, scenic views and more. The Planning and Zoning Commission is the crucial first step in guiding responsible city development. I hope that you don't vote yourselves into irrelevance by stepping away from the permitting process for cell towers in the residential zones. I urge you to, you and the city council, reject this single family and medium family rewrite, at multifamily rewrite, and to retain or strengthen the existing land development code 2.4.49 is currently written. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Appreciate your comments, sir. Appreciate your comments, sir. Okay, next we have uh, oh. Rory, you lowered your hand. Do you still want to you want to raise your hand again or are you okay? Um, we have nobody else from the public at this. Oh, sorry, we do. Uh, Wendy? Wendy Ratner, you can unmute yourself, there you go. Hi, Tammy, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, good morning, Tammy and commissioners. And I really appreciate your discussion today. And I understand um, you wanting to encourage uh, cell towers to move to industrial and commercial zones. And myself and my neighbors totally uh, support that. But my comment is going to focus on residential areas. And first, I have to concur with every single word that Ann Friday just said. Uh, since the City Council has been has directed the staff to rewrite the land code in regard to cell towers, myself and my neighbors would appreciate not only the discussion you're having now, but to strengthen 
the existing codes to protect residents. And we don't really see any discussion or any drafts brought before you that do that. And we would uh, really appreciate if you could request that that happen. And I just would like to give a for instance, there are many cities right now in discussion uh, about cell tower codes and protections of residents. And so one idea could be that a code could limit unnecessary emissions of a cell tower. You know, I appreciate a lot of the commissioner's comments that we need to be more educated, not only the commissioners, but the public. There's quite a bit out there in recent years that show that cell towers can run at very low wattage and emissions, but they're not regulated. But just as the attorney said, the city does have a lot of power in writing codes. We could research together and find the least amount of emission and wattage that a cell tower could run properly. And we could cap it. There are cities that actually make money because there are fines if the cell tower goes above the cap. That's just one example of many. And the other, which comes to play in a lot of the discussion we're having about cell tower placement. I really appreciate the commissioners uh, moving towards keeping the SUP process. It's so important for us to have a voice and to have a process, to, a due process to go through. But we would like to wake up every morning and not have to worry about where we live and what's going to happen and to be safe. And I think if we had stronger code of cell tower placement in residential area, for instance, if you wanted to put a cell tower near a resident, what is the safe amount to do it or safer distance? Right now, we have the distance of the height of a cell tower. So in our community, a cell tower 50 feet could be 50 feet from someone's land. And all of us right now and everything we've read said, that's not a really good idea. And would you like that as close to your homes, each and every one of you? looking out your window every day? I don't think so. So if we could move towards working together, doing more education, not rushing into it, and adding codes of protection, we, we would really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Wendy. So as a, a reminder to the commission, there are some state laws um, in place in regards to what we, I mean, when we do code rewrites, we can't make them more restrictive. We can do relaxations. Um, there's some protections under state law that were voted by the voters many years ago. And it used to be called Prop 207, but we can't call it that anymore because last year there was a new Prop 207 that over that. So we can't do that. It was a, and Matt might be able to help me, the protection of rights or regulations of. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so the old prop, the current prop 207 was marijuana. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was trying not to say we, that. <laughs> we, 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 we're trying to get away from re referring, but everyone still refers to it as prop 207, and we still refer to it as prop 207 and some of our waivers that we do during development agreements. But um, Prop 207 was codified in state law somewhere in Title 12, and what it talks about is a diminution of value of property. Uh, on a land use law. So if uh, a city changes a land use law and it somehow uh, has a negative monetary effect on someone's property, they have the ability to come and collect against the city. Um, so that's basically what that law is. I think most of you probably are vaguely familiar with it uh, through your work on the commission or in land use. So yeah, we try to, uh, we try to avoid uh, writing laws that would obviously uh, affect somebody's property values in a so, negative way. So usually when we do code amendments, we're doing relaxations of a code or to clarifications. Um, we can't make them stricter. And right now there is a state, a house bill coming through the process, um, which we're keeping a, an eye on that may change things a little bit too. Um, and we're gonna we're asking for more clarification on it in regards to small cell sites on private properties. So 
um, we always are watching for state statutes. The state statutes allows for small cell sites in the right of way with, uh, we can't, can't deny that. And they are now looking at it for private property too. So um, we are keeping an eye on that as it's moving forward. This week's gonna, where we see it moving forward or it may get striped to another bill. So this is a fun time at the legislative session where we're watching these bills very closely. And we'll update you at your next meeting on where that is and if we have any clarification on it to bring forward to you. Tammy, this is Don. I got a couple of questions. Does our new code make it easier for a cell tower to be built in a residential area? No, it does not. It's actually the same process. Um, under the current code, the way it's written, if, if they come in under the existing heights allowance, um, it's allowed by right without going through the SGP process. If they're exceeding the height allowance, which is what's being proposed still, that's not changing in the residential or multifamily or in those zoning districts. So okay. that is actually remaining the same. All righty. Now, can we put a definition for a compromised site in or not? I think that was discussed with a legal. Um, there's a compromised site usually means it's just a developed site. It's already been developed with a use on the property. It's not vacant. So we don't really want to see cell towers on a vacant piece of property. There, there was a, um, when we brought this forward to city council, we were looking at other jurisdictions. The city of Flagstaff, they have, um, they have where you have a, this is a preferred site, this is an okay site, and this is a least preferred site. And we were looking at possibly doing that, but there was some concerns that if it's allowed, it's allowed. If it has to go through SUP, it goes to it. We want to make sure it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, that way there's not someone saying, well, this is a neutral or at least you can't approve it, but you can. So there was a lot of legal questions about that. Um, but usually a compromised site is a developed site. But if they're coming through the SUP, SUP process, that's what's something you're gonna look at. Now we're introducing the word compromise site in this update and that wasn't in there before, was it? Is that true? We are. Mr. Chairman, this is George Worley, planning manager for the city. Yes, George. Um, I, I don't believe we have the word compromise site anywhere in the proposed draft. Um, that came out of a discussion at council. It was direction for us to look at how to address site locations, but we didn't include specific language that says we prefer a compromised site over another site. Keep in mind, we're dealing with zoning rather than building construction. So it's important that we don't get into that level of detail. Whether there's something there or not should be considered during the review process, but the process for review needs to be um, broad enough to cover any property within that particular zoning district so that we're not treating any property better or worse than any other property with the same zoning. So okay. again, I don't believe we use that terminology at all. That's what I wanted to clarify on that because I had not remembered seeing anything in there before. So I just want to make sure in that. And I have a question for Matt. In our last meeting, we had a discussion about multifamily. And is there a discrimination uh, by single family residents have one thing and a multifamily has another applying to that? And I still have a concern, you know, whether you live in a single home or you live in an apartment, it's, it's a residence. Now, can we take the definitions of condominiums and apartments and make that as part of a single family. So the zoning requirements or the requirements in a single family also apply to uh, multifamily units? But that's the way it is worded currently. So in the current proposal, we did add that the multifamily okay. uh, and all those are have to meet the height restrictions. So we didn't separate it out. But the height restrictions for a multifamily, what is that? Is that 35 feet? feet. It's the same right. as a single family. All righty, good. I just wanted to clarify that for everybody. 
Yeah. Mr. So, yeah, so here um, for the rural estate, single family, all these zoning districts all allow for 35 feet. So even a downtown business district for a single family residence is 35 feet, but for other uses, commercial and such are 50 feet. So we're not gonna see anything discriminatory, anything for that multifamily or resident between multifamily and single family residential, the way it's being proposed. Okay, good. It's good to clarify that. Other commissioners have any questions or comments? Mr. Chair, this is uh, Commissioner Lozell. I, I have one. That's great. Tammy, you said we can't make it more restrictive and this is not a suggestion at all, but I just want to clarify like uh, Chairman uh, had brought up. Uh, we can't make it more restrictive. So for an example, would taking it from 35 feet to say 20 foot to require a SUP, would that be more restrictive? Yes, because under the current code, um, the way it's written now that they they can come um, by right uh, under the existing height allowance. So if you're changing it to 20 feet, you're changing it for all the single family residential and a house can't be over 25, 20 feet or whatever you'd say. So we'd have to change it and that, that wouldn't make any sense for the city because- And I, this is more, back to educational type you know I, I want everybody to understand whether commissioner or or anyone else that that uh is interested in this that we can't take it backwards as far as the height limit correct Cor correct any other comments from commission members and we have no more from the public who wants to make a comment we do Absolutely. have someone we have someone who's been raising his hand. Um, let me. Rory, you're allowed to talk. You unmute so, yourself. Uh, there you go. Okay. This is uh, Rory Levy. And I just want to say my, my wife and I finally moved to our home here in Prescott at 3613 Bar Circle A Road. I'm happy about that. And I um, want to also I appreciate what the Planning and Zoning Commission did in denying in the five to two vote the SUP application for 4044 Bar Circle A Road uh, cell tower. And I hope that that continues in some way through the city council process as it is. Um, I don't believe the land use code had the way it's being rewritten, which would uh, exclude public hearing, public uh, participation and other preclusions will help uh, the process. Um, I'm concerned about that. And um, I just want to say that uh, one of the things about rewriting this wireless facilities regulation on private property, it's in the middle of a pending city council review action of a recommendation to deny that cell tower I mentioned. And that to me appears to be like an end run to do something around the city council, around the current recommendation, which we have to deny and to approve. Sorry, it we're not talking about any certain applications and this would not change that process. Well, I'd like to just finish. I understand that. I understand what you're saying. But just to put my two cents in, which I would like to continue, is to say that this uh, rewriting the regulations, the timing of it uh, concerns me because we had a process that was running pretty smoothly. And whether it's that cell tower or another cell tower, uh, I think the public uh, participation, such as in this Zoom meeting, should continue and should be part of the process, even when we, if the land use development code gets rewritten, where we wouldn't be excluded. So I'm just wondering, uh, this doesn't seem like a, a, a fair tactic that's in, uh, in good faith, frankly, to me. It's based, the space, this new rule and right is something that seems to be a way to bypass the, the process that has been going on for I understand many years, and it's, it's a fair process and the public is involved in every aspect. And I wouldn't wanna see that change. And that's what I like to say. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Rory. Um, and, and to clarify but, that, um, this, this rewrite doesn't change that at all. Basically what, what you have now is gonna continue in these zoning districts. So for the residential multifamily, um, it, it would have to go through the same process and have to go through the same special use permit process as we see now. So nothing's changing in those zoning districts. The only thing the zoning district that's gonna propose to change in is the industrial and commercial um, if they meet these height 
that's being proposed, then they would not have to go through the SUP process. But in the single family and multifamily and those other zoning districts, if they exceed the height allowance, they have to go through the SUP process, which is the same exact process that we have now. Mr. Chairman, this is Ted Gamboji. Yes, Ted. I think this uh, last exchange is a good example uh, that confirms my suggestion that we need to focus on education because uh, what Tammy has presented is, is actually uh, an advantage to residential by trying to move the cell tower into an industrial and not a residential. It, it maintains the same requirements for residential and yet it's not clearly understood. And when it's not clearly understood, that either suggests we're not doing a good job of communicating or the, or the audience that's hearing the message has, uh, has a filter on listening, which further suggests that we're gonna to need to spend some time educating ourselves and educating others on how to best communicate a solution for the future that's that's not a um, that's not going to be a simple solution. The city is growing. The demands for smartphones are greater. Uh, we're going to be faced with requirements for better coverage, and yet nobody wants a cell tower. So th those are mutually exclusive objectives, and somehow or other, we need to address that. Mr. Chairman, Tom Hutchison here. Yes, Tom. I'd like to pick up on what um, what, what uh, Commissioner Gamboji just, just spoke to. There, there's some folks at Stanford that believe that believe all of life's very difficult problems are embedded in four ethical contradictions. So ethics basically is doing what's right when there's no law that makes you do those things. So, so these ethical contradictions take the form of long-term versus short-term, justice versus mercy, truth versus loyalty. We just saw that in the election big time. And the one that this, this ethical contradiction that we find ourselves in right now today speaking about is community versus individual. And, and that's why this is difficult is that, you know, the community wants improved uh, cell phone coverage, um, yet the individual doesn't want a tower in his backyard. And somehow it's up to us to figure out that it's, ne it's, it's never one or the other, it's somewhere in the middle. We have to do both, you know, we have to do both satisfy the community's needs and the needs of the individuals that um, and, and I think I think this this proposal takes us a long way uh, toward getting to that acceptable middle, and, and that's part of the education too. Okay. Other comments? One of the comments or thoughts that come to me is how do we educate the public better than we have in the past, or are we doing the best we can to educate them? You know, these are sort of what if questions. I'm not sure there's an answer to it, but I, you know, I agree with Ted that education of this is a very important item, but how can we do that for the public on that? So that's why it's difficult. Yes. Any other comments from any other commission members? Tammy, I appreciate your effort you've done on this. I have a feeling the job's not quite done yet, but we will continue working on this. And I would encourage uh, the members of the public to also attend our next uh, meeting, virtually or however, and continue expressing your thoughts. Uh, we as commission members appreciate that. That's how we learn what the uh, public is thinking about and what we need to address at times too. Are there any staff updates? 
Um, we do have our, our, next, our next meeting is March 11th. You will be in chambers. Uh, City Hall will be open to the public. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> um, we do, but we still have Zoom available. So if anybody is not comfortable coming in or there was anything else, we still have the Zoom available. Just let us know. And we do have uh, two, three, three other applications as well as this. So rest up and uh, it'll be fun. Mr. Chair, yes, um, I would also note that there is a restriction to in-person attendance um, at 30, I believe total in chambers, um, I believe is the clerk's office standard. So I just wanted to call out um, to those that are attending from the public that we are going to continue having a Zoom option indefinitely probably long past any COVID concerns. We've found that this increases public participation and is beneficial to the process. Uh, so I just want people to be aware that if they are planning on coming in in person, uh, please check in with us because we will be monitoring the total number of folks in chambers for, for a period of time until those restrictions change. Um, I did also want to note that um, we do ha still have two hands up. I don't know if those are still just existing from the prior comments. Tammy, do you have any idea where those hands taken down before? And I know that we are sort of beyond that point in the meeting, but I didn't want to pass over the fact that there are two hands raised. And there are people that spoke already. So, I mean, but they we both, passed they both did speak already. I'm just not sure whether these are uh, maybe a leftover raised hand. Tammy, you did say it's March 11th? Yes, Thursday, March 11th. I've been called for jury duty, and I'm using this meeting as a possible reason not to go, but I may not be available on March 11th. So I just wanted to give you a heads up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If there is no other comments, I want to thank uh, commission members for taking time to attend this Zoom meeting here and look forward to being able to see people face to face again on March 11th. With that, uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you guys. Thank you all. Thank you. Hasta la vista. Thanks. Thanks.